subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello, our lovely viewers and students watching us from the comfort of your homes. Yeah, welcome to an exciting class on SHSR on Joy Learning. I'm going to be your facilitator, or Selkwami Martin, taking you through soil con conservation, a topic in integrated science, and the SHS2 level. Have your pens, have your books, and all that you need, other materials that I need for us to journey through this one hour. At the end of our lesson today, you, the student, should be able to explain the principle of soil and water conservation. You should be able to distinguish between macro and microorganisms, and also state some functions of soil nutrients and their deficiency symptoms. Yes, from the definition, you can see that there's something about the word soil. Soil. I believe you heard soil many times. From GHS primary school, you've heard soil. The word is you've heard. I also believe you've seen the soil before. Why? The house you live in is built on a soil. The road we walk on are built on a soil. Most time what comes to mind easily is when we talk about farmers. We think farmers plow the land. When you say the word the land, that means they are plowing the soil so that they can plant maize, cassava. So we uproot maize, we uproot cassava, the root tubers from the soil. We plant the maize on the soil. But where do you pass before you go to your school, to the market, to the church? Definitely, apart from the street, you may see some brown colored part, which probably is the soil. So, by default, you've seen soil before. Usually, the boys play football. You have a school park, and sometimes you have parts with green grass, parts with soil. So basically, you've seen soil. But the question is, where did soil come from? And how will you define soil? Anytime you see a stone, a small stone, put in your mind, it was a big stone. And many things have happened to it for it to keep breaking down into smaller forms. That small stone soon or some years to come will crash into very small particles that you can feel or spread in your palm. So to define soil, we say soil is the finely loose divided mat minerals and organic mat material that cover the earth surface. It can also be defined as the weathered part of the loose organic and inorganic materia where plants grow or where plant life exists. Let's hold on on the word weathered. That is the whole idea how we get soil. We also look at the F surface. So Let's start with the weathered idea. As I said, there are big rocks, either below the earth or some you see as mountains. Some erupt or show up in the sea. All these rocks, through some processes, will break down. So the process of breaking down rock through certain processes is called weathering of rocks. So a big rock would divide either by biological means, physical means, or chemical means into maybe less in sizable amount, less a very big, it has been broken down to mini forms or mini size, 
those mini size will be broken down again into smaller size smaller again to very small size very small size again to tiny size you can call pebbles and those things which can also crash again by processes and that crashed stone is what forms the soil we use so every soil you see today came from a very big rock yes so we get soil from big rocks but when they crash and they spread on the surface of the land let me put the land because you can use your hand to collect them we say they are very loose because you can spread them blow air onto it and it will just disappear so we say they are loose they use the word organic and inorganic material organic in the sense that they are living natural or living things every soil would have probably microorganisms or some macroorganisms like earthworm living in them in addition when these earthworm or the leaves that fall on the soil decompose or rot as we usually use in a simple way those things form the humus that mix up with the soil so the humus which is a decomposed form of a living organism plus the living organisms that are living in the soil constitute the organic part yes they constitute the organic part then this rock itself was a chemical element and all chemical elements are not organic you rather class one as inorganic material so to get a soil is a combination of living things or natural things and what we may say non natural things such as inorganic material when they form this together we human beings that work on it we grow plant on it and plant also life exists on them secondly the earth is very big people will move up of this earth with space shuttles and move outside the earth as a planet and when you come here you land on a solid part that solid part we call the land but the surface of that land is where we have soil beneath as deep 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 you are going to have huge rocks huge 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 rocks there's the rock that even when it rains the rain will penetrate that when it gets there it cannot go again we call the land table so you see that that means down there we are not going beyond rocks from rocks maybe go to the volcanic whatever down there so where we have that loose one is the one at the surface so if you are talking about soil you are talking about the loose one at the surface not the compact stony ones down there we can also define as we've said it's, it's also formed from the breakdown of rocks and decay of organic matter other accepted definition is that it's a complex mixture of mineral water organic matter or humus air and living organisms yeah, so this is how we define the soil what do you think is the importance of soil you can see what it uses from your head from all that we've discussed if you look at the farmers point you know what they use it for for plants you know what they use it for so giving you these ideas let's look at the importance or functions of soil first is that it is the soil itself is the source of nutrient for plant growth let me add a t to the word plant here plant growth why do we say nutrient we'll be going down the slide and you come across macro and micronutrients 
probably a nutrient are elements that the plant needs for growth and for a good life. But the rock that was formed, that came from nature, constitute elements. Yes, elements we studied during the periodic table, like sodium, like carbon, like hydrogen, like whatever you know, aluminum, silicon. All these are elements you know on the periodic table, yes. When you take the rock and you crash it and you test it, you find that they also contain this element. It is this same element the plant needs. So the soil that we work on, that we can use our hand to collect some, it is itself the element. Yes, it is itself the element. So the soil mixing with water can be going into reactions, but it is itself the element. So we say that it is the major source of nutrients for plant growth and development. In addition, when organisms die, they decompose, and those organisms also had nutrients in their body. And these nutrients or elements in their body will decompose into the soil and the plant to make use of it. So the soil as a soil is the first source of nutrient for the plant and its development. Another is that plants take water from the soil or from the ground, even when it rains and it settles on the leaf, it cannot penetrate into, through the leaves into the plant. Unless probably some few water plants, but for the land plant, it's like your body. You breathe in through your nostril, you take water through your mouth. When it rains and it settles on your skin, it will not penetrate your skin and enter your body. So for plants too, they need to take water. So they will wait for it to rain, or settle on the surface of the soil, there are a lot of chemical reactions that will bind some soil to the water. Some will leach or would penetrate down to the water table, whatever. The water is contained in soil before plant can absorb it. Another two is that the air that we breathe, it gets into spaces in the soil and this one would supply some amount of air to the plant we call it aeration or aeration let me spell aeration so plant need adequate amount of air to survive and they get this one from the soil Plants, when we grow them in the soil, I believe you've seen maize before. After cutting the corn, what do the farmers do? They uproot the maize plant and throw it away or burn it. The word uprooting means that something is fixed already in the soil. So the plant use their roots to get fixed in the soil so that they can stand not being pushed away by anybody or by strong wind or anything so that they can grow. So what we are driving at is that the soil serves as an anchorage or mechanical support for the plant. Yes, it's for them to grow into it, get firmly hooked in the soil so that they can undergo their life processes. Yes, the water plants will get there. They may not have soil in this sense, but they also survive. And one of the last points is that it serves as the habitat for soil organisms. I told you we have things like earthworm, millipedes, they live in the soil. All other worms, they are called macro-organisms. We have those we don't see with our eyes. Usually, when an organism dies, you know that it gets decomposed or rotten. Who does that? They are microorganisms. These microorganisms are also living in the soil. And they will decompose these bigger organisms that die. 
So we have bacteria. We have some prototest. We have some fungi, which are all living in the soil. In addition to this, let's look at the importance of soil water. Remember, when we were mentioning the functions or the importance of soil, we said that it provides them with soil water. And I start with that, we get soil water first. The first process is from the rain that comes from the atmosphere and settles on the soil. Some immediately will be hooked on with the reaction with the soil particle itself. Others will drain down, down, and go to the water table. The day that we want, it will, it will rise up. Yes. So these are the source of soil water. And what would the plant use it for? Sometimes yourself too can take water and a bucket of water or a watering can or use a irrigation method to water the place. That is also true. It's a source of water. Now we have all this source of water on the land. What do plants use this for? First of all, the plant root has an ability to absorb the water the pool of water around it into the root and from there will transport it through the stem up. When it gets to the stem up, I hope you've not forgotten your formula of photosynthesis. Let me write photosynthesis formula. We have what? Carbon dioxide plus water, giving you your c 6 h 12 o 6 plus oxygen. Then we put 6, 6, 6. So the water, this water, is the water we are talking about. We pick it from the soil or the ground. Then the plant will use this for photosynthesis. The next thing is that I told you that there are a lot of nutrients in the soil. It may come as a result that the rock itself that forms the soil has nutrients. Or we decompose to add nutrients. But for these nutrients to be picked up, they need to react to the soil to form what we call ions so that it can easily be picked up by the plant. The same, if you ever also observed, anytime farmers want to plant maize, usually, for some reasons, they will soak the maize in a bowl for a day, overnight. Why do you think they do that? There's a lot of chemical reactions that go on in the seed or the maize seed to make it put in a certain condition that immediately put in the soil, it can grow. Also note that farmers, after have, uh, clearing their plant, sometimes burning their farm, they wait for first rain, second rain, or third rain before they plant. All this because they need water for a process in germination. It will let the seed swell, break cover, to let whatever form the seedling come out. But all these one requires some chemical reactions and water does that. So if you see farmers soaking beans, maize, there's a reason. Another is that they assist, they assist in plant turgidity. If you can experiment with this, if you have a small potted plant like pepper or tomato, mint, dandelion, try not to water it for some days. You will see that we use the word wilting, some burning down, curving some way. Yes. Now, immediately you give it water, it looks fresh and see it standing straight or erect. It is because 
The cells in there are like a set of pen fixed to each other. If one is fully filled with water, it becomes bloated. We see, we say it's turgid. So the turgid one is full with water. The, can support the next one who is turgid, the next one who is turgid, and in that case, the whole plant can stand erect. But all of a sudden, if there's no water in them, they will shrink or they reduce in size. So if I reduce in size, I cannot carry you the one on top. You're also reducing in size. In that case, the whole fixed nature or turgid nature will shrink. And we say the plant wilts. The same water we are talking about aid in decomposition processes. I told you that when we die, the microorganism needs to decompose our body. But water, if water is around and there's enough warmth or good temperature, the process, the rate of decomposition is high. So we are saying that the water that we see or rains that fall onto the soil. Knowing or unknowing, there are plants that leaves on the on the soil, dead animals on the soil or in the soil, which need to be decomposed. The microorganisms already there. The water will come in, and a good temperature will come in, so that the rate or the how fast they want to decompose is achieved. And the last point is that they help in cooling of plants through transpiration. And what do you mean by the word transpiration? Let me simplify it. Human beings do what? Sweat. And when we sweat onto our skin, it evaporates. It's like doing... <sighs> what comes from your mouth? Like the steam. Plants also have a means that when they are filled with too much water and they are in the day and the sun is up and they feel like sweating. What you call sweating, they invariably call it transpiration. Transpiration is just the loss of water in the form of water vapor. Yes, the loss of water in the form of water vapor. So when we also sweat here, it's lost from our skin in the form of vapor to the atmosphere. In plants, we are calling it transpiration. In human, we are calling it evaporation. So we say that anytime you sweat and sweat leaves your body, you see that your temperature, the hotness in you has been removed by the evaporation. So your temperature cools down again. Plant is like you. So when they also transpire, and they lose the water in the form of water vapor, it makes the, ins the heat inside of the plant come down. Because the heat accompanied the water and they were lost together. Try on your own to when you feel very hot. One means of reducing your temperature is when you urinate. Imagine you urinate, you see some heat leaving because the heat came with the urine. And that's the same idea with transpiration. We are on soil and the soil water conservation. I just told you what we need soil water for. A lot of functions. So the plant needs it almost every day, every time. Like you, you also need water. But certain things can let us lose this water. So we have to put in practices that will prevent the carrying away of this soil and soil water. And they are rather referred to as soil and soil water conservation. So our practices should prevent first erosion, soil erosion. And when we say soil erosion, any means by which the soil particles on the surface of the land is carried from one place to somewhere. It can be carried by wind or can be carried by rain or water. We want to prevent that. Also, we also want to prevent or the loss of soil nutrients. So we say maintenance of soil nutrients or preventing soil loss, soil nutrient loss. 
I've shown you how we get nutrients. The soil itself is a nutrient, and the things that decompose and add up are nutrients. We want to prevent the loss of these two things. Let's see how we can prevent it. Let's brainstorm and think deep. Imagine this platform is full of water, it's full of sand or soil, any form, whatever you know, soil, loamy, clay, or sandy soil. Here. And I said, we want to prevent what? Erosion, which will carry some away, or the nutrient being carried away. So what are the means we will carry away? If it rains and it can touch this place, or touch the soil, it will disperse the soil from where they are to another place. So with this, then the first thing we are supposed to do is try to prevent the rain or the water from touching the soil. Or even if to touch it, prevent that the impact is not so much that it will carry it away at a top rate. Yes. So what do you think we can do if we want to prevent the heavy down pour of water onto the soil so strong that it will just splash it, carry it away, like you see in, under heavy rains. So the first thing could be, then let's cover this place. If you don't want dust to fall on something, what do you do? You cover the place with something. Yeah. So covering a place with something in terms of soil, Covering the soil with something is what we term as mulching. Whatever you want to use to cover the soil surface is called mulching. So let's look at mulching, methods of soil conservation. So a mulch is anything which may be laid or used to cover the soil and or ground spaces between plant and around the root of plants. Let me give you a picture of this. So you see that under the plant we have something like you can say grass, whatever material has been used to cover the base of the plant. We could use it to spread the entire area like this. You can use it to cover this whole area. But that would be difficult. The reason I'm showing this, if a, a farmer has a huge land, it may be difficult to cover the whole land with maybe a rubber or grasses across. So some prefer to do it just at the base. But if you see them using rubber, a polythene, to cover the whole surface, they are doing mulching. If you see them spreading grasses on the farm, they are also doing mulching. So mulching is just when we lay anything, the word is anything that can cover this, the soil surface or ground space between plants and around the root of plants. So you have banana leaves. You go to the village, you see them cutting banana leaves to cover the soil. We have sawdust that they spread, paper or dry leaves, straw, grass, cuttings, then stem of some crops like maize, when they finish harvesting, they just cut it and leave it on the surface of the land. What they are doing is also mulching. Because after harvesting, if they should burn immediately, they will expose the land. So they will cut and just leave it in crisscross fashion. So when it rains, it reduces the impact of the rain from touching the soil. Then, as I said, the first aim is to reduce the impact of the rain. The second aim is to retain soil nutrients and soil moisture. Yes, when we cover it, the scorching sun will not get access to the soil. Because if they get access to the soil, they will evaporate the water in them. They may even kill some organisms and also destroy some nutrients. 
So when we cover it, we prevent these conditions from, or these actions from taking place. Another means of preventing soil and soil water from being lost is that if you have a mulch, that can be artificial or natural. But if you want benefits, what do you do? You would rather grow a plant that has probably a broad branch with many leaves so that what should have we have should have we should have covered on the ground now we are doing at the top so before the rains even get to the ground we have reduced the impact of the speed and the strength of the rain from getting to the ground though it will come the leaves and the branches will take the heavy beating first and slowly let it trickle down at a lower rate. The same broad branches and leaves can also prevent the sun, the scorching sun, from destroying the soil. So what we are saying is what we term as afforestation. Planting trees, I use the word trees when I was talking, and shrubs on areas where trees were logged and where erosion is possible. When we do that too, the root of the plant or the tree will hold soil together. Like I said, the branches and the leaves will slow the impact of rain runoff, which can cause soil erosion. Another form of afforestation, this time not trees, because the word afforestation has the idea of trees in them, forest. So there's something like forest in it. Watch this word, forest in it. So it's like growing forests, most are made of trees and few low plants. But we are going to what the farmers usually do. Instead of planting trees that the next day they need to cut down, rather the farmers will prefer to plant crops or plants that are very close to the ground, like groundnut, beans, those with broad leaves that are also close to the ground. These kind of plants are called a cover crops because these crops will cover the surface of the land for you so we say this involves the grain of certain crops which cover or spread over the surface of the soil like sweet potato it's one creeping plant that before you realize the whole place is covered by the sweet potato we have your normal grasses the runners the green grass we have, they are always around you. These plants, what it does is that first the root holds the soil together. Roots hold soil together. What again can you add? Let me give you the answers. So you say the root holds and binds soil particles together so that they are less easily eroded or dislodged. Another is that binding the soil together also improves the retaining capacity of the soil. What are they retaining? They are retaining water. Yes, if the soil is loose and we plant a cover crop, most of the particles of the soil will grow around the root. As they do so, whenever it rains, water will not easily pass through immediately and be leached or drained to the water table, but rather they will take enough days to stay and at a good rate drain off 
So we are saying that the ability to hold it for some time is what we call the water retaining capacity. In addition, some plants, which are called the leguminous plants, after performing all the other functions, they have the ability to have a relationship with certain bacteria in their roots. And the process will lead to they taking nitrogen from the atmosphere, converting it in a certain way, giving some to the legume plant, and releasing the rest to the soil. So a soil that is lacking a lot of nitrogen, the best way is don't go and do it artificial way. Just plant leguminous plants and they would trap some bacteria, go through a process, get the atmosphere nitrogen, share it into two, give one to the plant and the bacteria itself and leave the rest in the soil very soon the soil then become uh, tends to have a lot of nitrogen in them now we have also said that it leaves are so broad that when a rain falls on it its impact is reduced the same thing the same leaves can also protect the soil from strong wind so that they don't face erosion. Another approach to conserving soil and the soil water is what we call the crop rotation. We define crop rotation as a process involving the grain of certain type of crops on a piece of land in sequence, rotating it year by year so that we maintain the fertility of the soil. Remember, we are preventing two things, loss of the soil particle by erosion and also maintaining the nutrient. In crop rotation, what we actually are doing is maintaining the soil fertility or a nutrient. Why? If I keep planting maize here, maize has specific requirements. If in a year I have to plant maize, which is a three month crop, and I zoom in every three months I can plant the maize. What happens is that January to March I plant, the maize will take some nutrient. The next three months, the same maize will take that same specific nutrient. So about four successive planting. The next year then, the nutrient needed by that plant has been exhausted. Where are you going to get it? So farmers rather thought it this way. Assuming one plant needs legume, we will plant a leguminous crop first, like what I explained. Then the legume will give nutrients such as nitrogen to the soil. After let's say three months, we will harvest it. Then we will come and plant another plant that rather needs the nitrogen that the legume plant has already deposited there. So when they take it away, it means that we've lost the nitrogen. Then we'll come and plant another plant that can give us that nitrogen back. So you see that we plant something that brings some nutrients. Then we plant another one that take it out. Then we plant another one that brings it. So you see what we are doing. We are rotating the planting from one plant to the other based on certain calculation and decisions we have to make. And that's what we term as crop rotation. So most we say usually a deep rooted crop follows a shallow rooted crop. Why? The deep will require to take their nutrient deep down, not at the surface. Because the root rather will grow so deep, it will take their root, their nutrient deep down. Then that means they will deplete all the nutrients down there. Then we will plant another <laughs> shallow rooted plant. Who would rather the next time don't need to go deep, but will just take few at the top. When they take those at the top, probably leaching and other things will drain some of the nutrient that was at the top down. Then we rotate it in that order. This is how the farmers utilize crop rotation. Another is what we call contour 
or ridge plowing. When you are on a slopey land, sometimes you see farmers planting on maybe the hillside of a mountain. They will need to prevent the soil from being eroded or carried away. So there are two things they do. They either plant along the contour or they do terracing. So when they plant around the contour in that direction of the mountain, what they are doing is contour plowing. That means they are growing the plant in that direction. This will hold the soil from being run down. But if they decide to do what we call the steps method, which is called a terracing, let's look at a picture of a terracing. So it's a step. So they create like the normal steps. So if it's being, the rain is washing the soil, it will start from the first step. If it has to go a distance before it goes down, in that sense, we are reducing the speed at which the soil is washed away. As compared to if it's on the hilly side of the mountain, that one will just come on the slope very straight. But if it's coming and there's a step this way, it will reduce the rate at which the soil was washed away. That's terracing. So this is terracing, and that's a picture you are going to see. So terracing deals with steps, like your staircase. While contour means plying along the design of the land to prevent washing away of soil by water. Another means is manuring. Sometimes by excessive planting, soil nutrients are lost. To get back to it, we rather will spread onto the farm either organic or inorganic substances. That is called the process called manuring. And what we spread is called the manure. So we say manure is inorganic material which is added to the soil. The aim is to supply the plant with a lot of nutrients or to renew usually the humus that was in the soil that was lost. There are types of manure. manure. We have the natural, organic, and artificial. Natural means comes from nature, such as uh, you can even add a fecal matter to it, the animal or farmyard manure. And the composite. Composite is formed when they put things like fish, cabbage, and use a process to decompose it and later spread it onto the farm. The, in artificial, the artificial or inorganic one are the fertilizers we buy manufactured from the industries. Usually, you have a popular one called MPK that farmers spread onto their farm. It stands for nitrogen, P stands for phosphorus. And K stands for potassium. So for all that we've discussed, we summarize some of them and use as a means of conserving soil moisture. If there, it has rained and there's a lot of moisture in the soil, what will happen for us to prevent the moisture from being lost? One is your cover cropping. Another is your mulching. Another is the organic manure I just spoke about. Once you spread on it, it has the ability to increase the soil structure so that it can retain water. Also, prevent deforestation and rather encourage afforestation. When you encourage afforestation and prevent deforestation, it covers the land inside that most water is reserved or contained in the groundwater. Then irrigation, use proper irrigation method. If there's no water, you rather give some more water. The little in there will rather will be lost. We also mentioned soil nutrients. I have said that they are substance or elements which plants depend on it for optimum growth and development. As the elements you see on your periodic table, but they occur either naturally or artificially. 
in the soil. There are two types, the micro and the macro nutrient. Why do we use the word macro and micro? Okay, let me turn around and say major and minor. Major means that they are needed in large amount or quantities on most basis to or in very short times. Example is the carbon dioxide, the hydrogen, the oxygen, the nitrogen. So the carbon itself, not the carbon dioxide, the carbon itself. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. These are the major ones the plant need on large and on daily basis. Micro or minor means needed in small, 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 small amount or small quantities, you can say trace amount. You have as copper, mag manganese, zinc, boron, and molybdenum. Note that whether you are major or you are minor, for the plant to use you, you have to be in the form of ions. So what I mentioned were neutral states. They need to react and lose some electrons somewhere and become either a cation or anion before the plant can pick them up. On your screen, you are supposed to know the functions of these nutrients. And if they don't, what happens? We are required to also know the functions of the nutrients. We'll just pass through the critical ones and keep them in your head and observe it on plant. One is nitrogen, which I've mentioned during the uh, teaching. Key thing is that nitrogen is used in protein synthesis. You, the body that grows, we need a lot of nitrogen. And also good for proper root development. If they don't have it, because it's good for proper root development, it's a root that holds the plant. Once they don't have it, there's a poor plant development or growth. Then the plant doesn't grow, grow well because human beings, you need protein in every part of your body. Plants also need protein in every part of their cells and their body. Once you are not getting it well, then there's stunted growth or you grow in a very reduced rate and become small. Nitrogen and phosphorus are needed in the DNA. So as nitrogen is needed in protein synthesis or your DNA formation, Phosphorus is also needed in that same DNA and RNA formation. So they're also for the same stem and root formation, seed and fruit formation. Not getting it the same consequence. The plant to have stunted growth or have a small growth size. Then there's what we call molting of leaves. The leaves doesn't open and grow in a nice greener form. They so say we use the word moated. They become also dull or green. Calcium, which in your body is for what? It's for strengthening of your bones. Here too, calcium is also for strengthening of plant. Because calcium is in the cell wall formation. And the cell wall that keeps the plant cell strong. They also involve in cell division, then activating some enzymes. And as I said, give rigidity to the plant. If you don't have it, you get stunted growth. Very poor root and shoot growth. Another is potassium. It is needed in activating some enzymes in the plant life, especially in the photosynthesis and respiration process. Failure to get it means that photosynthesis will suffer. They are also using as a catalyst in protein synthesis. The way we make protein, potassium is needed. There is also made in cell membrane formation. When you don't get it, the leaf may develop some red color or purple or yellow or brownish color at the margins. So if you see some dots and yellow color just at the margins, not at the main side, then know that potassium 
is inadequate in the plant. Then the plant becomes weak and plant may die prematurely. Sulfur, also found in ATP and coenzymes. They are also used in amino acid. Amino acid is the building block of protein. And sulfur is needed in making that. If you don't get sulfur, your stems become smaller or slender. So if you know the natural size of the stem of a tomato, and at the normal month you're supposed to see it grow to a certain size, it's not growing, then you can then predict that you have a sulfur problem. And there's poor root growth. Magnesium. Somebody needed in chlorophyll. You've had chlorophyll, chlorophyll. The key component in trapping the light to make photosynthesis is magnesium. So you need magnesium every day because plants will need to make photosynthesis. So they are also needed in cell division and activating some enzymes. Failure to get it means that plants will not make their photosynthesis. Then there is a yellowing. This one not at the margin, spread on the leaf. It's called chlorosis. Usually on the vein part, the vein where we transport the water. If you see yellowing there, then you are seeing chlorosis, and it's due to lack of magnesium. Then iron is also synthesis of chlor chlorophyll. Same, if magnesium is used for synthesis of chlorophyll and they become yellow, Iron is involved in the structure of the compound needed for photosynthesis. So they also will become yellow. Let's look at the last area, which is the micronutrient. Those needed in trace amounts, small amount. Zinc. The first one is zinc. Plants also have homes, like the way you have your own hormones, what we call growth hormones. It's called, the popular name is called auxin. We need zinc in most of the plant hormone formation, the auxin formation. And this same zinc is involved in protein synthesis and activating of some enzymes. Once enzyme come in and synthesis of protein come in, if you don't get them, your leaves will become small and you have stunted growth. Chlorine is needed for oxygen to be released during photosynthesis. It needs to be there for a chemical reaction to take place before we can release oxygen. If we can release it, the whole process, the oxygen will stay within the plant. And we say this affects growth. Copper. We use copper as oxidizing, constituent of certain oxidizing and reducing enzymes. They also act as electron carriers for chlorophyll, a very complex process. But copper, though tiny, is needed in the electron carrier process for chlorophyll. If you don't get copper in your body, and that's in plant, they die. We are something we call the die back disease of citrus and other trees. Then there's what we call poor growth. The last is nickel, necessary for nitrogen metabolism. When we say metabolism, we say biochemical processes that go on in your body. Nickel is needed for those kind of chemical processes to ensure that it is smoothly occurring. Once it cannot occur, it affects your entire growth. So there's what we call stunted growth and chlorosis deficiency. The last slide you are supposed to look at is soil fertility. We've mentioned having all that in your body. If you have it in good amount, then say that the soil is fertile. If nutrients are adequate, air is adequate, water is adequate, and the amount of soil is 
quantity is adequate, then we say there is fertility. And the characterizers are said that as we have adequate supply of soil nutrients, the content should be useful for soil organisms, rich in organic matter, a suitable pH, and a good aeration. These are the good characters of a soil. This is the first part of our soil study. We'll come back with the part two, where we look at other aspects of the soil, such as loam, sand, testing, and the texture and everything. I believe we've covered enough. We've looked at soil definition. We've looked at what can let us lose our fert uh, fertility nutrient and maintenance of the soil moisture or soil water. We've also looked at the nutrients. I'll implore you to go over it as it to be the basis of the second part. What are takeaways? We say soil is the fine divided particles on the surface of earth crust. Practicing something like mulching, manuring, cover cropping will prevent soil and maintain them say soil it leads to productivity in a minute write these questions down try it on your hand when you meet the next time we'll go over these questions and see how far you understood thanks for being with us stay with us on shs hour on joy learning as your facilitator sir kwame amwaten to we meet again it's a bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.